Welcome to those of you who have joined today's webinar. I'm Maria Williams with the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. Change is bringing you the latest environmental health science through our partnership calls and webinars, science serves, publications, and social media. I would like to welcome everyone to today's partnership webinar, which is titled Invisible Hazards, State of the Science on EMF Health Impacts and Next Steps for Policy Change. Our moderator today is Tony Stein, coordinator of Chase EMF Science Serve. Hi, all. We will leave time following the presentations for a brief Q&A session. You may type in questions through the Q&A feature available on the menu bar at the top of your window at any point during the presentations. After the presentations, our moderator will read out questions for our presenters to respond to. We will get to as many comments and questions as we can during the Q&A period. For those of you who call in on the phone, we have posted slides to accompany today's webinar on our website. You can download these by going to healthandenvironment.org. Please scroll to the bottom of the page and select today's webinar. On the webinar page is a link to the slides. Everyone on the webinar right now is muted with the exception of our moderator and our speakers. This webinar is scheduled to last for 60 minutes and is being recorded for our call and webinar archive. With that, I'll turn things over to you, Tony. Terrific, thank you, Maria. It, it's such an honor for today. We have three wonderful speakers, including um, Dr. Frank Barnes, Dr. Jukun Lee, and Dr. Joel Moskowitz. Our first guest is Dr. Frank Barnes, PhD. He has a, a Bachelor's of Science in Electrical Engineering from Pr Princeton University, also a Master of Science and a PhD from Stanford University, and he's a distinguished professor at the University of Colorado um, and a of engineering uh, engineer. And um, he's also the winner of the Gordon Prize for Innovations in Engineering Education from the National Academy. Dr. Barnes is a fellow of the Institute of in Electrical and Electronics Engineering, better known as IEEE and the American Association for Advancement of Science. He's the Vice President of IEEE's for Publications and Chairman of the Electron Device Society, President of Bioelectromagnetic Society, U.S. Chair of the Commission K International Union of Radio Sciences. Thank you. I want to introduce you, Dr. Barnes. Thank you, Tony, for your introduction. Incidentally, those offices are all in the past, but <laughs> we'll go from there. <laughs> anyway, it's a pleasure to be on, and I hope to be able to tell you a little bit about what I think we know and what we need to learn with respect to uh, the effects of magnetic fields and the magnetic electric fields. So what I attempt to do is provide some theory and some experiments that provide a basis for the mechanism from going from the physics through the chemistry to the biology that can lead to health effects. Some understanding of how weak magnetic and radio frequency electromagnetic fields can change the concentrations of radicals, reactive oxygen, nitrogen, and these in turn can cause health effects. Secondly, or third, I should say, more importantly in many respects, is that we're not, we have modeled the feedback and repair processes to help explain why we see both positive and negative results and other times see no changes in things like cancer growth rates. And I think it's important that you be able to describe why you don't see things as well as why you do. And then I'll finish by adding some speculations on the possible implications of long-term low-level exposure to RF fields. So background on this is there's been a debate for a very long time on the possible health effects of low levels of uh, RF fields. And that goes back, if there's anything that more than 50 years, and the question is based on it, does it create a temperature rise more than one degree? Second piece of background is the philosophical approach in the United States has been to set standards so that they let the technology develop useful applications by studying the standards uh, below the lowest level proven to be dangerous. And the word proven is important there, plus some safety factor. And it's different for say designing bridges than it is for RF or it is for a given drug. 
And then if we were to require the technology to be safe against all those things we haven't thought of, we simply wouldn't introduce it. So that's part of a background in terms of looking at this program problem from an overall perspective. All right, so here's a limited, very limited summary of some of the standards. First, the standards at low frequencies are set on a basis of an electric field that's large enough to fire a nerve cell. And the number in the IEEE standards is approximately five kilovolts per meter for frequencies left in less than 368 hertz. For our F exposures, the limit set is set on the basis of heating, and typically that's specified in terms of specific absorption rate, or SAR, of one watt per kilogram over one gram at 900 megahertz. And there are arguments about whether things should be over one gram or over 10 grams, and what the numbers should be, but this is roughly one of the more conservative parts of the current standards. And then, since you can't always measure that because it changes as you age, you change your position, et cetera, the far field exposures are set at one milliwatt per centimeter squared for six minutes in the range from 30 megahertz to 300 megahertz. And they've got functions of frequency and so forth at other, other levels. But that's a simplified version of the current standards. Now, the current standards do not address the possibility of the biological or possible health effects from long-term low-level exposures to electric and magnetic fields. And this is for good reason, one of which includes a difficulty in getting reproducible results, a lack of mechanism from going from the physics through the chemistry to the biological changes that lead to health effects. Now this part of things is changing now, but these standards were basically set back in 1995, and this was pretty well where things were at that stage of the game. All right, now the reason I got involved in looking at some of these issues has to do with some following experiments. First of all, in my lab, we showed that we could change the growth rate of fibrosarcoma cells, HT1080 cells, and pancreatic cells, uh, with magnetic, by canceling out the Earth's magnetic field and going to fields that are less than 18 microtesla. Secondly, we showed a decrease, if I look at the study on National Toxicology Study of 1999, and I'm interested, you wound up seeing small decreases in the cancer incidents in mice and rats for exposures that they were looking at. And they properly concluded that was not evidence for increasing the average cancer rate. And then we've seen also in, in, in Olsman's paper, an increase in the growth rate of cancer cells with RF frequencies, a 50% increase in, and also changes in the hydrogen peroxide concentrations. And we'll talk more about that as we go along. Now, additional experiments that are in part of the background for me is changes in measured free radical concentrations. And looking at the interphone study, where you had both some increases and decreases depending on the reported exposure levels. And we'll talk about that more, but on the average, you wound up with the conclusions after many years of argument as to what to put in their report that on the average, they did not have uh, data that led to changing standards. All right, now the hypothesis I'll put forward is that we can change concentration of free radicals, meaning OH minus, OH, uh, or I mean O2 minus, OH minus, and hydrogen peroxide and calcium, which are not radicals with magnetic fields. These molecules are both molecules that can be used in signaling biological systems to do things we want them to do, but they can also do damage to lipids, proteins, and DNA. And third, there are feedback and repair processes, so we do not see damage most of the time. So that's a hypothesis that I'm working from. Now, I need to define what I mean by a free radical. Free radical means that I have an unpaired electron spin. That makes these atoms very, uh, very active. And they can recombine rapidly with other, other protons, other molecules rather, because nature likes to wind up with these things evenly paired up on that. Now, the magnetic field couples to a magnetic moment of the electrons, 
and can change both the energy and the angular momentum. And conservation of the angular momentum leads to one of the major reasons why we think changes in uh, radical recombination rates. I'll take one brief minute and talk a little bit about the effect of static magnetic fields. And this is for a deuterium molecule, which is very much simpler than the other things. And what you see on the graph on the left is that as I increase the magnetic field, the spacing between the energy levels in this molecule change as I increase the field. It means that I can shift any resonances by changing the static magnetic field. And when these lines cross, I couple energies together. Or when I wind up applying, as I was in the green lines here, a frequency which is, corresponds to the distance between those two energy levels, I can couple one, one, the particles in one energy level to the particles in the next energy level. And the diagram on the right shows that we have to take into account the nuclear spins as well. But I won't go into that because we don't have that kind of time. All right, now what this leads to, when I look at radical pairs, if you look at the left, I have a series of energy levels that deal with uh, nitric oxide. And on the right, I've postulated some energy levels. When these two energy levels line up, essentially where the red line F equals three halves corresponds to the M equals minus one half in the J three halves level, I get rapid recombination. If I shift as I have in the slide in B1, so that these two energy levels do not dine up, then I wind up with a barrier for uh, recombination. And that in turn leads to, if I have split a molecule in part with say optical energy or thermal energy or chemical energy, to an increased probability that I have an additional radical pair. So you can think of this a bit as you've got two electrons that are coupled slightly differently to the, uh, in each of the two fragments of this radical pair to their nuclei, and they're circulating at different rates. And when they lined up parallel, they're not allowed to recombine by the Pauli exclusion principle. When they're lined up oppositely, they recombine rapidly. We won't go into that farther. All right, but that does some theoretical background as to why we can see changes in concentration of radicals when we change the static magnetic field, or if we couple those energy levels in one of the two radical parts of the radical pair, we can also change the recombination rate. So what's been observed is in an exposure at seven megahertz at 10 microtesla right, root mean square for three days, in a DC magnetic field of 45 microtesla leads to a change, a 45% decrease in O2 minus and a 50% increase in hydrogen peroxide. And it's also seen in these same experiments was an enhancement of the cellular proliferation up to say 40% in two days and 45% in three days. So we have a way when we're changing magnetic fields or changing exposure to an RF field of changing the growth rate of these cancer cells. Okay, now hydrogen peroxide is a, a one we looked at, and it's a normal part of the metabolic process. It's both a signaling molecule and it can be destructive to, uh, and, uh, as well. And it's a bit like your grandmother told you. At low levels, it's a good thing, it's, or, or not a good thing in this case, stimulates a, the growth rate of cancer cells, but at a high level, it kills them. So, but reactive oxygen and hydrogen peroxide are a normal part of the cell's metabolic processes. And we see as many as 20,000 uh, radical pairs per cell per day created. Now, we do, we use that, and it's a normal part of what's going on. And for example, when you exercise, you increase the amount of radicals in the and reactive oxygen species. And you can increase this concentration by 10 to 15 times, but then it relaxes back to the baseline. However, the problems occur if you wind up keeping that elevated levels for a long period of time, and then you reset the baseline. 
And this is when this is associated with things like aging, cancer, and Alzheimer's. All right. Next question is, why don't we see effects most of the time? The feedback and repair process are part of a normal way of living. None of us would be alive today if we didn't have them. When you cut your finger, you don't bleed to death. All right, when we generate excess reactive oxygen, it also triggers the generation of additional antioxidants. But there's a time delay for the generation of these antioxidants and the reduction of the hydrogen peroxide. So I've got a feedback loop with a time delay. All right, there are many kinds of biological amplifiers. So we're talking about using the magnetic or electric fields as a signaling mechanism and the metabolic energy supplies the energy to drive the amplifier. There are more than 3000 signaling proteins in biological systems and more than 15 second measurements. Most of these biological amplifiers are contain negative feedback to stabilize the system. However, because of the time delay, if we pride a periodic signal, the system and the system has gain, it depends on the timing of the, of the signal with respect to the natural, say oscillation frequency or gain of the system. So an increase in hydrogen peroxide leads to an increase in the antioxidant, which leads to a decrease in the reduction. Now I can get either amplification or attenuation with this and think of this in terms of, of pushing a swing. If you push the swing at the peak, you wind up accelerating it. If you push it at the bottom, you wind up stopping it. We have the same thing going on with respect to timing in any of the oscillating systems inside the biological system. And one we've been looking at particularly has to do with hydrogen peroxide. Okay, now here's some experiments of one of my former students, Cindy Bingham, back in 1996. And what she showed is she changed the amplitude at 60 hertz. She could increase the growth rate of mastocytoma cells up by a factor of three to four, but she changed the amplitude by a small amount and she wound up cutting the growth rate by over 50%. Now, at the time Cindy did this work, we had not one clue as to what was going on. But if you take some of the things that people do and you take the average of that, you'd say on the average, she didn't see anything. And I, my favorite cartoon with respect to that is this guy with a block of ice on his head standing in a bucket of hot water. On the average, he's at the right temperature. So it doesn't tell us what we want to know necessarily. All right. Observed changes in hydrogen peroxide and growth rates, HT1080 cells, fiber sarcoma cells. Again, quoting the work on that is, an exposure at 10 microtesla, five to 10 and 10 megahertz at right angles showed an static magnetic field of 45 microtesla for eight hours increased hydrogen peroxide production by 55%. The reduction of cell count by 30% on day two. And these changes are time dependent. So you have to worry about exactly how you do the experiments if you're gonna get reproducible results. And you've got to control the static magnetic fields, which many biologists don't realize is a variable. And you have to control all the biological variables as well. So it's time dependent, and this is an important factor. All right, let's switch topics for a moment and say, well, what people are worried about base station exposures, and this is an experiment out of India, which shows people living at 80 meters from a base station are and on the average exposed to higher levels of uh, radio frequencies than those living 300 meters away. And on data analysis on the exposed group, and this is a small sample, so you've got to be careful about it, shows that the there's an increase in the micronuclei for the people living within uh, 80 meters compared to those living 300 meters. And the analysis, because they were able to draw blood on this, shows a significant attrition, uh, attrition in gladiatome, I can't pronounce things right, catalase, and superoxide uh, has or SOD, and a rise in, in lipid pre-oxidation. So you're getting changes then in the background of 
antioxidant concentrations. So since I'm running out of time, very briefly, standards currently are set on the basis of short-term and heating for RF. Low levels of magnetic field can lead both increases and decreases in the concentration of radicals. The effects of, are a function of frequency, the angle between the AC and DC, which we haven't talked about, amplitudes and pulse repetition rates, and the biological effects of these things are expected to be a function of time, depend on other stresses. This is Tony. I just want to give you a heads up that uh, we're close to time out here and want to change over when you're ready. Said he showed no overall elevation. We're out of time. <laughs> okay. Anyway, well, I, just I, to finish. Anyway, you do get some implications out of this, and we'll we'll cut off and we'll pick that up later if we have time. Great, thank you very much. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Dekun Lee. Um, Dr. Dekun Lee is an MD, PhD, and MPH. He's a senior research scientist at Kaiser Permanente, Northern California, here in Oakland. And he uh, has a PhD in epidemiology from the University of Washington and more than 100 peer-reviewed publications. He's received more than 10 research grants from federal agencies, including NIH, CDC, FDA, and AHRQ, and he's recognized for his longstanding experience in international collaboration, collaboration with other researchers. He was an invited by the U.S. National Academy of Science to evaluate Sino-U.S. collaboration in biomedical research. Dr. Lee, welcome. Oh, hi, uh, Tony. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, can everybody see the slide? Looks good. Okay. So uh, um, it's nice that uh, Frank already gave us some uh, magnetic overview about the possible health effect of EMF. So my talk today, hopefully after 15 minutes, uh, you can take away about uh, my assessment how we get here in terms of the EMF health effect, what are the uh, challenges, debates, controversies uh, at this point. Before I forget, I want everybody to know this is uh, EMF health effect is not that different from what we already very well know about the, how we uh, throughout the process understanding the tobacco health effect. In fact, it's the same with other environmental exposure as well, for example, uh, like endocrine disruptor, BPA stuff. So it's not that different. So if you didn't quite understand because EMF, only difference EMF is still ongoing, uh, you can go look at the literature has been very well written about how all the process frustrations and uh, and uh, uh, process of our tobacco health effect throughout the 100 years of history. And uh, um, Unfortunately, we were hoping that uh, a lesson learned from tobacco experience will uh, make the public health understanding or the measures uh, go much more efficiently, but sometimes history is painfully similar. So, so that's, I wanna put out there first. If you have anything you can go, because I hear a lot of people very frustrated with this process. So what I tried to do is slightly different from what Frank just did is look at overview because I'm an epidemiologist. I just based on my perspective, my experience to more than 20 years in this area studying health effect of EMF, trying to understand what the, what's going on, why there's so much uh, controversial or the, maybe even still a lot of misperception, not just the, uh, in the general public, even in the scientific community. So uh, the EMF health effect was raised uh, back in 1979 by these two uh, scientists. And looking back, uh, if eventually EMF did have a health effect and we're studying it, we have to be great, forever grateful for those two scientists. But at the same time, just like live events, they left the two legacies, I think, uh, unfortunate legacies that uh, uh, may have contributed to the whatever the controversial we have right now. Because they look at the, the so-called EMF, uh, they, they barely measured any EMF. They basically looked at the power wire without the wire, wire codes, thickness wire. I don't have time to go into this. But basically, 
they look at the, the they find association actually with this Y code with child leukemia. So they published that paper. Looking back, they were extremely lucky. So in, in that kind of crude measurement, which basically no measurement of EMF, they were able to find this association, uh, which was fine. But as we know, luck cannot be repeated. So many study, so they love the two legs, which one, number one is, you know, it had a very poor measurement, basically no measurement of EMF. Number two, to look at the outcome, which I deemed is not that sensitive. So, so a lot of studies afterwards trying to replicate the studies, many of them failed. So that led to the misconception that their EMF was just no, no, so it's no health effect. It was just that that study was, a, was, was a fluke. But then, of course, uh, a lot of scientists continue to work on this by improving in the, in the concept of measurements. You can see I listed here, people looking at, uh, still trying to improve. Eventually, the best was, I'm, I'm talking about the relatively low frequency, like a power frequency. People started, in, invented the, you know, uh, the meter. They actually can capture the EMF wherever you go. So that's the best so far at this point. So that's what the, our study uh, started uh, using that. So you can see the top ones that the last most of study have been using basically are not really measure EMF, even though they claim they study EMF health effect. This is the point that I trying to make. If you cannot measure EMF, please do not say your study is examining EMF health effect. Because by definition, if you can't measure exposure, you you're not going to find any association even association is there so so just like if you can measure smoking tobacco smoking how can you claim when you say there's no smoking relationship with anything or lung cancer for example so that's that's very straightforward concept but it has been plagued with this health because everybody because it's difficult to measure that's true but then the people wanted to study it so they claimed the majority of the study out there says they could not find association there's no association to me that's because number one you didn't really measure emf if you didn't measure em you can't claim that there was no association so then second one was a cancer started with uh, uh Einheimer study. So people are focused on the cancer. Now, of course, later on, many years later, the cell phones started showing up. People started looking at the cancer as well because they were focusing on the phone next to the head. So ideal situation was that, uh, uh, not ideal, but that uh, uh, common sense is, oh, you, you're looking at the brain cancer. So the problem with that is cancer is extremely insensitive outcome to study. Yeah, you can study it. There may be effect. It's just very, very difficult to demonstrate effect for the many reasons I'm going to talk about here, the latency. And also the combination of a both rare outcome, long latency, they force people to use very crude measurement because cancer takes 25 years. It's rare cancer. So by definition, without getting into it, you have to do case control study. When you do case study, you basically wait until cancer happens. Then you go back to ask 25 years ago, what is your EMF exposure? Of course, nobody is going to know that. Even I don't know, and you don't know. Even currently, what is a EMF exposure without measuring it? You ask people 25 years ago, what is EMF exposure? So those are totally, you know, exacerbates the problem I just described. So bottom line is uh, you can study cancer, that's fine, but you should uh, shift the focus to study more sensitive uh, end point first, so which make you relatively easier and short to find out this effect. So right now, the prevailing concept is still based on the older literature saying that uh, there was no health effect, biologic effect, regardless of what outcome we're talking about. The largely, of course, is based on cancer. So then the, the debate right now is also uh, whether uh, is power line frequency versus shifting to the cell phone uh, EMF. So people have a, a debate because yes, they, are, they, they have different frequencies. Uh, cell phone fre EMF has a much higher frequency and the power line frequency is much lower uh, than there's debate. The, the, my question is, they both are EMF, only difference is the frequency, just like they both are fat. It doesn't matter whether you're coming from uh, chicken and pork or whatever, can they be different? Yes, they can. But how likely it's going to be different? Someone has to study. But assumption, sh assumption shouldn't be they are different. Assumption should be they probably similar and unless demonstrate different. Only thing is though, 
low frequency EMF, like what we are studying, power lamp, has a lot of more literature they are showing that is may not be good, has health effect. High frequency at a cell phone level, they have very little study. Many studies show there's no effect largely because they didn't really measure, couldn't measure. So, so if you dismiss this, disconnect these things, then you cannot use the evidence from low frequency to, to apply to the high frequency cell phone. So that's there's some confusion there, a dismissive attitude. So another thing, the history is uh, people have been focusing on the uh, energy level, largely from the evolving of science. By the way, I'm not criticizing anybody. That's the emerging science tends to happen that way. So, so people started learning more things and then learn more. So at the beginning, it's a lot of physicists involved with EMF because a lot of biomedical scientists didn't really understand what the, how, how is this EMF works? What is EMF anyway? So, so a lot of physicists involved, they had a lot of arguments that cannot possibly cause any health effect. This level is so low because they're focused on energy. And there's another argument that you don't hear anymore, but I used to hear is like Earth's magnetic field is much stronger. But Earth, without getting into too much, Earth's magnetic field does exist. It's called a static magnetic field. They never changes. So my argument is that any species cannot tolerate Earth's magnetic field, which has been here for since the beginning of the Earth, which is 4 billion years, they probably never evolved. Our species here, they have no problem with uh, Earth's us uh, uh, magnetic field. The question is, we're adding man-made magnetic field. Is there a health effect? So you don't hear this anymore, but it, sometimes you, I still get a question from a, a physicist. So the key thing we right now you need to separate what is a non-thermal effect. In other words, most the public care about is is EMF causing not a heating injury. Is causing cancer, causing miscarriage, causing child disease, or causing you know autoimmune disease? Those are the non-thermal effects. So uh, why EMF? You probably all know because EMF right now is hugely uh, almost everybody is exposed at least in the developing countries. So this is uh, if this uh, exposure has some issues, we really need to study this because when something is so widely exposed, even everybody exposed, even there is only tiny increased risk the public health implication is huge compared to something even very toxic, but it's only very, very, very small people like occupation people exposed. It still needs to be studied, but their public health implication is much smaller. So, so this is the things. Then also the, the, the uh, outcome I listed here, mostly from my study, except the uh, uh, blood glucose level that's done by uh, um, NCI a study published in the JAMA many years ago, they show that at the minimal, that EMF does have biological effect. We can debate whether they, they all cause those endpoints, but at the least, right now at this point, all we needed to show as scientists is biological EMF does have biological effect because in the wider community, a lot of people or most and majority of people, still, including scientists, still do not think EMF has any biological effect. So now I'm going to quickly talk a little bit about, that's not my focus, talk about what we did. And, uh, uh, but just give you an example of how to, what are the correct study should be done. And the main is a focus on, uh, we, we look at the pregnancy, the part of is my, my focus of research also partly is, as I said, it's more sensitive outcome. Without getting into this, pregnancy is most sensitive period, and any biological environmental exposure can be amplified and also easy to detect, particularly if you look at pregnancy outcome only nine months. But even when you go to kid, uh, childhood, their offspring, uh, it's usually a few years rather than decades. So that's part of a reason uh, we did. So this study is done in the Kaiser, uh, Northern California. We recruited a pregnant woman during the first and second trimester, and we did the interview, and we certainly conducted the measure. We asked a woman to carry the measure. So this is the key. We actually measured EMF exposure. We asked women carry, not only just the 24 hours, even though that's not perfect, ideally you want to ask women to carry throughout their pregnancy, which is not feasible, but at least the 24 hours capture exposure from all sources, not just the home, not just the work, not just the money outside, wherever they go, it's captured for 24 hours. And also we're trying to make sure it's typical that this is another way we have found this rather study repeatedly because ultimately our purpose, think about our purpose. Purpose is trying to measure this 24 hour period to truly reflect this woman's true exposure during 
during uh, pregnancy because that's the period we really care about, even though we can't measure uh, throughout the pregnancy. So one way to do that is in, after measurements, we ask women, is this your typical day during pregnancy, your activity wise? So if this typical day idea was, uh, yeah, your measure capture today is probably more likely to reflect your true exposure during pregnancy compared if it's not a typical day. It turns out that was really true throughout the, the multiple studies. And this is the one we find overall. I'll just give you an overview. We find it double, almost triples risk. If you have high EMF exposure, your miscarriage uh, uh, raises 2.7 times higher. Your, your mother exposed during pregnancy, I'm talking about your uh, child during next pregnancy, the child from index pregnancy, you have two point, uh, you know, uh, 250 times higher the risk of uh, asthma. And also we publish almost five times the risk of obesity. And we also find a neurological problem with, in this case, ADHD. We also uh, find out that there's three times the risk if you, uh, you have a thyroid abnormality. So we also have, we didn't find uh, uh, those response for miscarriage, as I will explain a little bit of which, which means miscarriage is the death of the embryos. So once you reach that level, this probably the explanation why, once you above that threshold level, you further high, it's not gonna show any of those response. But for the other outcomes, we didn't see those response. And we did find a uh, traditional, uh, typical day is much stronger association. That's again, emphasize the point of, uh, of how important it's measured uh, correctly. So here is the example of, uh, uh, as, uh, in the context of miscarriage, which we published about a few months ago, where, which if you overall combine them all together, your overall rate is one, roughly 1 1.5, which means 50% increased risk if you have high EMF exposure compared to, I'm talking about women compared to the lower one. But if you look at a typical day, it's got it to almost three times. And if you don't, if you measure on a non-typical day, even though you measured, compared to the all other study, don't even measure it. So your risk is gone. If you look at the non-typical day, you will make a conclusion that says, that, oh, exposure to EMF, high exposure in pregnancy, there's no association. So this is another way to basically emphasize the importance of how, how uh, measuring uh, correctly. So this shows I just told for miscarriage, we didn't see those response. Uh, our interpretation could be that the, because miscarriage really have threshold effect. Once the embryo is there, you further increase probably not going to find uh, those response. This is the one we showed actually does have those response in the context of the uh, 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 asthma risk among offsprings. So you can see the this is called a survival uh, curve. That means uh, uh, X X is going to three years or the 14 years. So what is your likelihood that you still asthma free? So top line is the ones with the lowest uh, uh, maternal exposure of EMF. You can see. They had the lowest, uh, they had the highest chance to survive of to the uh, asthma free. The highest at uh, the lower end, uh, you can see here, is uh, is the, has the lowest chance to survive. Uh, so it's a point, uh, sixty percent still asthma free versus ninety percent, almost ninety percent uh, the, the asthma free. So what is the conclusion? The conclusion is uh, uh, we did find, at least in our study, we did find uh, uh, in the context of miscarriage, we have some uh, uh, increase. Actually, we have uh, several studies. We had uh, two studies done different times, and there was another study done by uh, Raymond Notch's group, but also published. They 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 reanalyzed finding exactly the same thing. High EMF does increase risk of uh, miscarriage. We also find a lot of long term outcomes that uh, that needs to be replicated. Those are only published by our uh, groups. So the other people should continue, but we have to be able to continue to study this. If you don't study this, ultimately this EMF effect will be done by uh, determined by science. So, but you have to do science, do it correctly in order to move this forward. Okay, I hope I'm wasting time. I know it's uh, pretty long. Thank That's you it. very much, Dr. Lee. Excellent. Um, I would like to uh, move to our next uh, speaker, Dr. Joel Moskowitz. Dr. Joel Mosquis is the director of the Center for Family and Community Health at UC Berkeley School of Public Health. Dr. Mosquis has pub published extensively on smoking and cancer prevention. He also has the electromagnetic radiation safety website that has over 1.5 million visitors from more than 200 countries. He's an advisor to the Berkeley Cell Phone Right to Know Ordinance he was 
and also the advisor to the International EMF Scientist Appeal, signed by more than 230 EMF scientists. He's also been awarded the 2018 James Madison Freedom of Information Award from the Northern California Chapter of the Society of Professional Journalists. Thank you very much, Dr. Moskowitz. Please take the, take the microphone. Uh, thank you, Tony. Can you hear me? Yes. Good, okay. Um, I became involved in this area of research in 2009 when my colleagues and I uh, published a meta-analysis of the uh, research on tumor risk and mobile phone use. And uh, we found that in the higher quality studies, which, were, which had no industry, funded stud, uh, industry funding, uh, we found uh, an association between uh, long-term mobile phone use and brain tumor risk, specifically brain cancer. Uh, this generated a considerable amount of media attention and intrigued me in the, uh, in the subject area because I had known virtually nothing about this research prior to doing this meta-analysis. And I began to wonder why there was so much misinformation or ignorance about this whole topic. And so, and I soon discovered there was essentially no funding to do research on this topic. So I began to uh, follow uh, the research that was largely being conducted in other countries and translating that research and disseminating it to whatever audiences uh, were interested in it. And uh, since 2013, I began to uh, report on much of the research and policy developments on a website known as Electromagnetic Radiation Safety or saferemr.com. And so uh, I have a limited time here today. I'm gonna to talk about some of the policy developments I've been most associated with uh, but there's much more detail on my website along with lots of research summaries. In 2011, seven years ago, the International Agency for Research on Cancer convened an expert working group, uh, 31 of the leading experts on radiofrequency radiation and health. Uh, and this expert group came to the conclusion that radiofrequency radiation uh, should be classified as, a, as possibly carcinogenic to humans. Uh, and it was largely based upon uh, evidence of increased risk for brain cancer among wire wireless phone users. Strangely enough, uh, the WHO has hardly changed its position with, uh, with regard to radiofrequency radiation since 2011. And very few governments have taken uh, this information uh, very seriously in terms of changing public policy. Um, in 2015, uh, I was an advisor to, uh, with a group of EMF scientists uh, that put together a petition that was signed by 190 EMF scientists, all of whom had published uh, peer-reviewed research on EMF and health or biology. Um, and this petition called for precautionary health warnings and stronger regulation of electromagnetic fields, specifically uh, non-thermal exposures, not just thermal exposures, which, which is all we're currently being protected from. Uh, as of this year, we now have 237 scientists who have signed the appeal, representing 41 different nations. And uh, a recent count I did uh, of EMF publications in professional journals found 2,000 papers and, and letters to the editor uh, published by these 237 scientists. The US government has basically taken a wait and see attitude. Uh, it, it demands conclusive evidence and yet on the other hand has hardly funded any research. The only exception being the National Toxicology Program study uh, which the FDA called for in 1999, and uh, we still don't have final reports uh, as at this particular time. Uh, the recent uh, peer review, though, did declare um, that th the study found clear evidence of a very rare type of heart cancer in male rats and some evidence in, uh, of other types of cancer and other kinds of effects in rats and in mice. 
also evidence of DNA damage in both rats and mice. Um, several several um, governmental agencies have criticized the FCC and the federal government's role in this. The FCC is the uh, regulatory agency over RF or radio frequency radiation. Uh, the US Department of Interior, for example, in 2014, in a submission to the FCC, uh, claimed that the um, RF exposure guidelines are, were, now, were now nearly 30 years out of date and inapplicable uh, because they only controlled for thermal heating. Uh, the cities of Boston and Philadelphia also basically accused the federal health agencies of um, negligence. Pass the buck attitude was the language they used in their submission. The World Health Organization and, and federal health agencies and federal regulatory agency websites all contain language which tends to minimize the perception that there's any risk from radio frequency radiation. Here are some direct quotes that are still, still appear on these websites. And you can see you have to really parse the language closely uh, because, because the statements are, are in large part misleading or, or completely inaccurate. Uh, and in part, I think this is because um, the few experts that we had in, in the federal health agencies have long ago left these agencies um, or uh, either by going to industry or by retirement. Uh, and so we're in a situation where essentially the blind is leading the blind with regard to our federal health agencies. The FCC, which is the, sorry, um, which is the regulatory agency over RF radiation, uh, has been captured by industry according to a detailed investigation by Norm Alster, uh, a career journalist who spent a year at MIT, or at Harvard, sorry, uh, has published a monograph called Captured Agency, How the FCC is Dominated by the Industry it, it Presumably Regulates. The FCC depends upon uh, various federal health agencies, especially the FDA, for uh, information about the health risks of radio frequency radiation. But as I said earlier, uh, these agencies really have essentially no expertise left, and they tend to rely on scientists who have strong industry ties uh, to provide them with insight about the current state of the research. Uh, there was, or there is an R radio frequency interagency work group, but over time that became dysfunctional. It never had any real authority. Uh, I interviewed a number of members of that group several years ago and found that they didn't, they only met through teleconference, one hour teleconferences three times a year which is hardly enough to keep abreast of the research. Uh, and they didn't report to any superiors what they found. There were no minutes kept of the meetings. Uh, so it's basically a sham organization that gives some cover to the FDA and the FCC that they're keeping abreast of the research. A number of agencies and, and organizations have called on the FCC for policy changes. The FCC collects input uh, but then doesn't do anything with this input. Um, and so as a result, the radio frequency exposure guidelines don't, don't ever change uh, and the industry gets to proceed in its merry way. Uh, for detailed information about how the industry has manipulated uh, the public policy, uh, over the years. An excellent website is Microwave News, edited by Lewis Lesson, uh, who's been covering uh, these issues in this industry for more than 35 years. And a recent report in The Nation, although not totally accurate, uh, does a pretty good job in exposing uh, how uh, the wireless industry, particularly the telecom industry, uh, has made us believe that cell phones are safe by manufacturing doubt essentially following the same playbook that the tobacco industry used successfully for decades. Uh, the telecom industry is, and the military has been also engaged in this campaign uh, at various times, especially in the early years. The trade organization for the wireless industry 
is the CTIA. Uh, they typically work behind the scenes uh, manipulating uh, the positions of federal agencies in the FCC uh, and then hide behind the statements that those agencies make. Uh, I think it's because their lawyers have told them not to make direct statements because that would just increase their liability when these product liability lawsuits uh, finally appear before a jury. In 2010, uh, during this period, um, numerous, about a half a dozen states and numerous cities around the country tried to pass cell phone right to know ordinances, basically trying to um, make their residents aware that they should take precautions with regard to cell phone use. Uh, and uh, a number of ordinances and, and state laws were put forward, but the CTIA was successful in virtually every case in killing off those laws. Uh, however, San Francisco did adopt a cell phone right to know ordinance. Uh, the CTIA followed, filed a federal lawsuit right away. Uh, the courts took some issue with regard to some of the health concerns raised in the uh, warnings that the, the city uh, wanted cell phone retailers uh, to post. And so the, the ordinance was revised. Um, but the CTIA then, and, and the federal district court actually approved, approved of the law, but the CTIA appealed to the uh, Ninth Circuit Court, the Federal Appeals Court, uh, which overturned the lower court's decision in an unpublished opinion. Uh, this, the appeals court wanted the case to be sent back to the district court uh, to be resolved. Uh, but at that point, the uh, San Francisco Board of Supervisors uh, no longer uh, wanted to pursue the law. And so they basically disbanded with the law and that was the end of the, the San Francisco law. The city of Berkeley at that time was also considering adopting a cell phone right to know ordinance, but didn't want to get involved in the lawsuit. However, when it saw what happened to San Francisco, it, the city felt that it could learn uh, from that. And it, the city proposed a law that was uh, much narrower and much more modest in its intent, which would require cell phone retailers to post a warning uh, about the RF exposure and not, deal, not address the, the health risks per se, because the court seemed to have it take issue with that since the federal health agencies hadn't recognized the health risks. Uh, this law was adopted in 2015. The CTIA once again filed the federal lawsuit. Uh, the city, uh, based on the court ruling, stripped off one sentence that focused on uh, the exposure to children. The law actually took effect. The judge approved of the law. The law took effect uh, two years ago. Uh, in the meantime, though, the CTIA has appealed to block the law, and uh, the appeals court turned down the CTIA. Uh, so the CTIA has currently appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, and we should hear probably within the next few days whether the Supreme Court will take the case. Uh, so I suspect that the CTIA will pursue uh, the litigation and go back to the district court if the Supreme Court turns them down. Uh, so that, is, that issue is far from over. And here's uh, what, the, what the actual notifications that the city of Berkeley wants its uh, residents to see. And this is posted in, in the uh, cell phone retail stores in the city currently and has been for the past two years. In 2009, the California Department of Public Health drafted a cell phone safety guidance document, uh, which has been suppressed for eight years. Uh, in 2014, I was tipped off by a wireless safety advocate and submitted three public records requests. These were all denied. In 2015, the New York Times Wall Street Journal also submitted public records requests because I tipped them off. Those were denied. 2016, uh, the UC Berkeley Environmental Law Clinic and the First Amendment Project filed a lawsuit on my behalf, a pro bono lawsuit. We won that case. Uh, a year ago, the uh, court forced the department to release the draft documents of this cell phone guidance document. There were 27 versions of it released. Uh, in December of uh, last year, the CTIA published its final 
guidance document. Um, this was not required by the court, by the way. Um, here's what the document looks like. It's a three-page document. It can be, it can be uh, downloaded from the uh, CDPH website. Uh, it's in the public domain. Every city and county and state, for that matter, can now disseminate this document should they so desire. Uh, this is arguably the strongest statement made by a public health agency in the United States to date. Uh, with regard to the health risks, as well as with regard to potential uh, ways to reduce one's exposure to cell phone radiation. The latest threat to the population and to population health and environmental health is 5G. Uh, this was mentioned by, I think, both of the earlier speakers. This is the fifth generation of cellular technology. I have a number of posts on my website uh, that address um, what 5G is and what the potential health effects, particularly of millimeter waves, but there's also low band and high and mid band uh, frequencies that are being uh, used for 5G. Uh, other good websites and the links are here are the Physicians for Safe Technology and the Environmental Health Trust. If you want to get up to speed on the 5G issue, uh, a group of 200 scientists have signed a petition calling for a moratorium in the European Union on uh, the rollout of 5G. Uh, this was submitted to the uh, European Commission. The Commission uh, denied the request. And um, most recently, the International Society of Doctors for the Environment also submitted an appeal that there be a moratorium on 5G. Uh, the US uh, member organization is Physicians uh, for Social Responsibility. Uh, so I've covered a number of, of policy developments. There's a lot more one could, con one could discuss had, had we the time with regard to cell towers, Wi-Fi in the schools, uh, smart meters. There's been a whole host of uh, attempts at policy, uh, but the industry has been very uh, successful in pushing back efforts at the local, state, and federal level to date. Uh, so what is really needed is a membership organization along the lines of Americans for Non-Smokers' Rights. I think that would be a good model to deal with wireless safety issues uh, and provide technical assistance and support uh, to the many uh, communities around the country who are fighting uh, wireless safety issues. So I'll leave it at that and so we have some time for questions. Thank you very much. I want to respond to some of the questions um, that have been posted on the Q&A section. Um, for, I've reviewed them and um, there seems to be a couple of uh, questions regarding exposure limits in the U.S. and I want to open that up to all the speakers here to uh, believe um, if you would uh, state whether or not you think the federal agency or state and local government public health um, exposure limits are sufficient currently or what should happen? Well, as I said in my lecture, um, the belief of, of many, many scientists, EMF scientists, is that the exposure levels are completely inadequate. Uh, and need to be substantially revised. Um, but let's hear from the other speakers as well on this. I think something needs to be done with respect to long-term low-level exposures, which is simply not in the standards at all. You know, something along in those lines, whether it becomes advisory or no one deals with it, I think is, takes longer to debate than we have. But I think something with respect to long-term low-level exposure data and information ought to be shared much more, more widely. Can I, uh, I saw a question, Tony, I don't know how you wanted to measure. I saw someone uh, ask uh, that uh, for me to correct a statement, a high, high frequency uh, EMF study um, was not as uh, 
has more study done in the low frequency. Shall, shall I make a clarification here? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, the, what I uh, talk about is epidemiological studies. So in the low frequency uh, study, since the whole EMF starts with low frequency, we have many, many, we we'll talk about human studies, epidemiological studies, looking at all kinds of the outcome. Mm -hmm. uh, so in comparison to high frequency, basically that's called the cell, cell phone frequency. So cell phone frequency, only study I'm aware of are done with uh, like in biggest is uh, uh, interphone studies. So those are study uh, outcome basically is only one outcome. I mean, nowadays they have some uh, studies coming out to, to look at also child uh, neurology development. But mostly is about brain cancer. And as I said before, those studies largely made a conclusion there's no association except they didn't really measure cell phone frequency back 25 years before the cancer occurred. So that's what I'm talking. I'm not talking about as animal studies, uh, in, your, in vitro studies, in vivo studies, or those. I'm talking about the human studies because that's what the study or the uh, federal agencies, without getting into too much of a how risk assessment is done by 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 the uh, by the federal agencies. That's what they they are relying on. So as, as Joe indicated right now, all those federal agencies in the United States anyway, all those agencies refuse to, to claim there's any fact is because they are usually using argument about you don't have enough human studies to show that. The, the animal studies, they pretty much it's, can be used as a confirmatory. They cannot be used. If you don't have a human study show association, they are not going to, federal agency is not going to take it. That, that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about this uh, uh, in vivo, in vitro, or the animal study. Okay, yeah. hopefully that clarified that. Great, we have um, one other question from Dr. Raymond Nutra. Uh, I wanted to see if you saw that. It says, will you be publishing on the interaction between high, high typical day exposures and the measurements you have on the dirtiness of the subject's home EMF? Uh, we look at the dirty, I talked to, I can, I think I emailed Raymond before, uh, we can talk about more detail, that's totally different, the subject, in terms of uh, the hypothesis different, measurement is different, uh, whatever the underlying mechanism is different. Uh, I thought I sent a Raymond before about some preliminary result in, in the context of dirty uh, uh, electricity, but if he wants more idea and the more, we, we can certainly talk about this uh, privately. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to follow up on, on Dukun's response to the prior question. We also have a series of studies done by Hardell showing up to a threefold risk for 25 years of wireless phone use. Uh, and we have, we have a, st a study out of France, the Serenet study, showing increased um, brain cancer risk uh, for long-term cell phone users and heavy cell phone users at even lower levels uh, than the Interphone study. Plus, there's been a number of subsequent interphone papers, uh, almost all of which are showing much stronger uh, effects on brain cancer than the original pooled paper uh, reported. So there is a substantial amount of evidence for carcinogenicity and cancer effects in humans from epidemiologic case control studies. Uh, there's also a fair amount of a similar number of studies showing effects on acoustic neuroma, non malignant tumor in the brain. Uh, these are all reported on my, and summarized on my website. For more information, uh, see at saferemr.com. Thank you. Um, I also wanted to move to the idea about um, uh, best practices. And one of the questions says, what's the best resource for how to avoid EMF? Or what, we had some other questions on best practices do you have any suggestions, any of the speakers? Yeah, well, I have, an, I have a safe tips page on my website. And so I have tip sheets, including the California Department of Public Health tip sheet. Uh, there's a number of uh, measures people can take. My own tip sheet is there as well. So I suggest people take a look at that for uh, various sources of uh, safety tips. The bottom line actually is you just remember distance is your friend in this case without getting to too much in the details. 
Yeah, I think uh, those websites and also actually NIEHS has, has a very good website, even though they don't uh, uh, establish a relationship, but they do have where the sources are and how to avoid that. I'd like to come back to this thing as that you can expect to see both positive and negative effects. And there's very good evidence that we can, in some cases, prevent the growth of cancer with, with pulse magnetic fields. So you've got both things going in both directions and you need to sort that out. So I think that's part of what has to be taken into account in this thing, because you're going to see both kinds of results and you're going to see no results. These are all part of what you should expect. No. Yeah, also, I want to emphasize from a helicopter point of view, but the whole EM health effect is right now what we need to change is the very sick perception that EMF, not, not the people here probably, EMF doesn't have biological effects. If we can persuade the public and policymakers or scientific community that EMF doesn't have biological effect, then the further research, in my opinion, will follow. Because right now the people have such a dismissive attitude for whatever the reason some of I alluded in my talk. We need to change that. Ultimately, we need to stimulate, hopefully, more research in this area. I concur on that. Yeah. Uh, I fully concur on that. We also need to stop the, the deployment of uh, new technologies and exposure to frequencies uh, and types of modulation and pulsing and beam forming. Uh, that are essentially is a massive experiment on the population, not knowing what the outcomes are going to be. It also affects plant, plant life, animal life, and uh, microorganisms, uh, these frequencies. And so uh, it's really taking a huge risk with the whole entire planet by rolling out 5G with all these different frequencies uh, and putting millions of cell phone antennas in, in the U.S. and around the world uh, that don't exist at this current time. I would think that you, uh, it would be very hard to decide when you've done enough research to say that this either does or doesn't do something. And I expect the effects will be time dependent and sometimes you'll see something, sometimes you won't. Certainly depending on which way 5G goes, you're gonna get different physics, different absorption depths and probably different exposure type results. So I expect you'll see a lot of different things if you go to different frequency bands, particularly if you go up into the millimeter wave band where the absorption depth is very short. Most of what you will see will be within a few millimeters or maybe even less than that depending on the frequency of the surface of the skin. The, the research on, on the millimeter wave suggests that the effects will be primarily on the, the eyes, the testes, the skin, the sweat glands, uh, and the peripheral nervous system in humans. But we may see some profound effects on microorganisms. Uh, there's some evidence to indicate that certain species will become antibiotic resistant uh, with exposure to uh, micro uh, millimeter waves. Uh, and it, it will have some profound effects on certain insects, depending on their size. Uh, so I, I just think it's not prudent to just roll out this technology without any idea what the long-term consequences are for uh, our species and other species. And just a point of clarification that millimeter wavelengths are 5G, correct? Uh, in, in part, they, they will be using these high bands from 27 uh, gigahertz up. Uh, they'll also be using low bands around five, 600 megahertz. Uh, and mid bands, roughly two and a half to three and a half gigahertz. So it's going to be a combination of frequencies as this gets deployed. Uh, frequencies that have never been used before for large commercial applications. They've been basically reserved for very special applications. So not many people have been exposed to them on en masse. Well, I want to thank everyone for both attending and for all of the presentations. Thank you very much. Maria, do you want to come back in? Yes, thank you so much, Tony. We are approaching the end of today's webinar. A video recording will be available on the CHE website soon, and tomorrow you will receive an email containing a link to the recording. 
Today's next webinar from the CHE EDC Strategies Partnership will take place next Wednesday, May 16th, and is titled, Does Early Bisphenol A Exposure Cause Hyperactivity in Children? A Systematic Review. You can RSVP through CHE's website, healthandenvironment.org. If you are new to CHE and would like to stay updated about upcoming events and more, please sign up to receive our newsletter by selecting the Join Us tab at the top of any page on our website. Additionally, if you appreciate these CHE partnership webinars, bringing you the latest environmental health research for free, we encourage you to support CHE's ongoing work by making a tax-deductible donation via our secure website. Again, our website is healthandenvironment.org. With that, I would like to thank our speakers for taking the time to present today and Tony for her excellent moderation. Thank you so much for joining us and have a great day.